Okay, so I will give this uh, this lecture that I didn't have time to talk about during the four lectures at CHIN. So this will be the last one, I guess, supposedly to be the last lecture. So I will talk about uh, so-called periodic version of Riemann zeta function. And this is called the uh, Kubota Leopold. PIDL function. Uh, <coughs> so the basic idea is that, let me just call it LPS, but I'll change for other notations later on. The upshot is that what this thing is, is it periodically interpolate special values of the data function. In particular, the data function at the negative integers, which we know they are rational numbers. If n is odd, and if n is even, then it's zero. So here's the meaning of this in a more concrete way, or like in a more, uh, or, or I guess one way I think of this is it gives a systematic way to explain the following theorem of Kummer. Kummer, so-called Kummer's congruence, maybe. This is, let, let's say P is greater than or equal to three, be a prime. And for any integer k, if n1 is common to n2, modulo, well, essentially modulo a high power p, but also you want n1 and n2 to be congruent mod p minus one. And also, you want a technical condition that p minus one does not divide n i plus one for for any I mean like for for any n one plus one or n two plus plus one. I mean like they're congruent mod p minus one, so one of the conditions is the same. It's, it suffices. And also, I want n one n two to be greater than equal to k. Then, with these two conditions, the zeta value at these negative integers n one n two are congruent modulo p to the k. Excuse me, earlier here, this should be uh, p to the k minus one. So I want to say that this Kummer's congruence was proved like in the 19th century, but people only get to understand what's behind it uh, in the, around the uh, uh, 1960s when people started to develop periodic theory and the PIDL function and also developed this called Iwasawa theory. Let me sort of give an example of this. Uh, so p equals seven, and k equals two. And in this case, we know we take two numbers, uh, n one into between three and forty five, modulo forty two, and you can check that this negative three is one over twelve. Uh, excuse me, one over one twenty, and this is expands at one plus seven times four times seven plus dot dot dot, and the other one is uh, negative forty five, and this is a long number is denominator fourth and this is this, this is like about i think about 20 digits here i'm not going to write but then if you expand it periodically this looks like one plus four times seven plus something so this at least the first leading two terms are the same so they're congruent mod seven square and i say, can also give an example if this condition that p minus one does not divide mi plus one fails, uh, these two will not be congruent to that number. So I'll maybe skip that. We can give examples of that. So now let's talk about the proof of this. The first step is basically given algebraic way to access the special value zeta negative n. So this is related to so-called Bernoulli numbers. Uh, but our presentation is off by slightly. 
So let's quickly recall. We're going to do a little bit of analysis now. So I'm going to recall the gamma function, which is integration from zero to infinity of e to the negative t of t to the s, dt over t. The reason I wrote dt over t is because this is, I think of this kind of a multiplicative uh, measure. Then if I multiply the Riemann data function with this gamma s, then I get, you know, putting these together, I get e to the negative t, uh, t to the s, and this the sum of one over n to the s times this dt to the t. And then I can, you know, if, if, if real part of s is sufficiently large, this converges absolutely so I can swap the two integrations and swap the integration with the sum. Now, if I put them together, I have t over n to the s. So now clearly I can change variable. T goes to nt. And this way I get negative nt and t to the s. The benefit of, the benefit of uh, having this marriage be dt over t is that when I change t to nt, this doesn't change. I guess somehow a little bit easier that way. Now I can sort of swap back in these two. And we see that it's a geometric series. So I get integration of zero to infinity of e to the negative t of one minus e to the negative t. That's the geometric series here. That's the sort of geometric series I have here. And I have time t to the s, t dt. And maybe I want positive powers of t. So I multiply the numerator and denominator by e to the t. So I get one minus e to the t minus one, t to the s, dt over t, okay? So let's rewrite what we have here. So now in this case, I can rewrite zeta s as one over gamma s times integration of from zero to infinity of one over e to the t minus one, t to the s dt over t. So that's just sort of a way to change my zeta function a little bit. Here's, here's a technical lemma. So I'm gonna use this formula, maybe I just, but in the red box here. So this is a working formula for zeta. Sorry. Sorry, technical issues. Why can't I move? Oh. Okay. So I have some. Okay. Now, now, good. It's very strange technical issues. So okay, since we're going to prove a technical lemma, now there's going to be tech, there was some technical issues. <laughs> okay, so here's a technical lemma. I'm gonna I'm gonna consider somehow this kind of expression here, and for me, I'll think of this this middle one. This is some sort of particular function f of t. So my zeta s takes this form of one my or one over gamma s with this integration of this f of t with t to the s dt over t. I will say that for any sort of functions like this, there's a good way to express the negative value of zeta in terms of this function f as follows. So this is sort of a relatively general lemma, which I think is just tailored for our application. If, this is, if you have some function on the positive part of the real line and it's smooth, Uh, it's called rapidly, uh, it's rapidly decreasing. Meaning that multiply with any high power of t, t to the n, the function will 
also goes always go to zero as t is large enough. And also, I want TFT to be bounded on the other end so as t goes to zero. So these are some sort of very technical conditions here. But of course, our f of t, this function, automatically satisfies this because you see that uh, if uh, t goes to infinity, this e to the t is a huge number compared to any sort of powers of t. On the other hand, as t goes to zero, uh, this e to the t minus t is roughly t. And therefore, I have t times one over t, so roughly is one. So that's somehow leading term is one, and there's some sort of fudge term. So it's anyway, it's bounded as t goes to zero. Okay, so I have this. Then I can define the L function of f s. This is just some sort of fake thing. But I, I want to Im imitate what we define for a data function. So that this kind of a this expression kind of a works in general. Like this. At least when real part of s is is bigger than zero. Then this expression will have will has an analytic continuation to all of S in C. And or maybe I should say meromorphic continuation. Maybe it was, oh, excuse me, that's okay. Yeah. Ah, this is a meromorphic continuation. And the thing I, I really care about is F, the next value of this thing is equal to negative one to nth power of the nth derivative. So this is the nth derivative of F evaluated at zero. So this is the formula I really want. So uh, I guess a corollary of this is that combining this with the above formula over there, the zeta minus n can be written completely algebraically is, oopsie, is minus n to the nth power times fn zero derivative with f of k being one over e to the t minus one. Okay, so let's let's give a proof of this uh, technical lemma. Uh, uh, so let's prove, and of course I have to uh, minus some convergence issues. Since our topic is really pi numbers, so I'm going to be very, uh, I'm very loose on the analytic side. In fact, I'm I'm going to assume that f t is zero when t is large enough. But this is okay. I mean, like, I mean, in the gen in general, all such f will be kind of a limit of these things. You can modify the proof to make the make sure this is okay. So let's write down the definition and then do the calculation. So I have this thing, integration from zero to infinity of ft uh, t to the s dt over t. Okay. So I'm going to do a integration by parts. How do I do that? Well, I want to say, okay, I want to think of this as, I want to think of this as, I'll maybe just write directly. So I have this one over gamma s here, which is place here. And I have to function f t of t to the, maybe maybe it's time to kind of note that now it's kind of combine these two together. It's a t to s y minus one. So if I do this, you know, if I have this function and I take derivative of that, that's precisely t to the s minus one, which is what we have over here, right? If, I, if you do integration by parts, that means that you want to you want to sort of evaluate this, evaluate this f t times t to the s over s at infinity and at zero, minus minus well, the thing. I mean, you right now you take you took the derivative on the first term. Now you want to take the derivative on the and the second term. So this s times gamma s 
of integration from zero to infinity of s prime f prime t t to the s plus one. Uh, uh, excuse me, t to the s uh, dt over t. Okay. Oh, sorry, sorry. I mean, I mean, I, I also write t here, so I have plus one here. Okay. So it's t to the s, and then breaks it to t to the s plus one over t. Just want to write things in in a uniform way as before. Now let's do look at the first term here. So this is where the conditions, the conversion conditions over here comes in play. Well, f is t is large enough, this goes to zero. And somehow or like I can even show it's even assume it's zero. So therefore, at infinity, this is just zero. On the other hand, at zero, the same condition will also tells me that this is also uh, this will also go to zero because my s I, I, I gonna uh, so uh, later on I'm gonna take my s to be negative numbers somehow. Uh, excuse me. Uh, sorry, I'm blanked. Uh, so I mean, uh, sorry. Excuse me. Excuse me. Sorry. Sorry. I, I still want my real part of s is greater than equal to zero. So therefore, this is so. So this is zero. Okay. Now I have this expression over here. We're left with this. Now we note that this is a gamma function property. So this is the same as gamma s plus one. So let's rewrite this, what we have here. If you look at it, this is the minus of L, L of f prime of s plus one. Okay. And uh, if you believe, so as I said, so I'm, I'm gonna ignore some convergence issues. And therefore I'm gonna assume that this does have a meromorphic continuation. You can kind of do it this way as well. And then, in fact, this will give, or I mean, should I say, somehow this give you a way to relate LFS with F prime evaluated as a plus one. And you can sort of continue it this way and get to minus one to the N pl uh, plus one times L of F nth derivative of S plus N plus one. Okay, so now by some sort of continuation, you can show that somehow this was holds even without this condition by continuation. And therefore, LF evaluated at the negative n will be the same as minus one to the n plus one of L of F n plus one derivative evaluated at one. And then when that happens, this is just the same thing where the L function for, uh, sorry, let's zoom out a little bit. So that's just basically, if you evaluate S equals one to this expression, to this expression over here, gamma one is one, and then you just get integration of, from zero to infinity of F of T, DT, uh, excuse me, N plus one derivative. And that's essentially sort of minus one to the nth power of F nth derivative of zero. Okay, so you can apply, so, so that's basically the proof, minus some convergence issue and an analytic continuation, which I'm not gonna talk about. So, okay, so that, so, so that sort of uh, explains that our two-step process. First of all, I write the Riemann zeta function as uh, some one over gamma, oh, sorry, over one over gamma s of some integration like this. Next thing is that I realize that uh, any integration like this, the L value of this thing at negative n is precise, just higher derivative of f. Now I can deduce a corollary that zeta minus n is just this derivative here. So let me copy this here to later because I'm gonna use it. So here's a corollary. Now I wanna now I wanna talk about step two. Now the, the benefit is that now I really have algebraic expression. I just need to sort of uh, interpolate the derivative of an explicit function and evaluate at zero. So that's better, I guess. So periodic interpolation. 
maybe I should also point out that this is very close. This is this number is very close to relate to the uh, Bernoulli number. Very closely related to that, but I will not talk about it now. So here's a, some technical note before I do this periodic uh, interpolation. So we know that this, this Riemann zeta function has a pole at s equals one. So would, so somehow the general philosophy is that you know whatever is whatever is true over the reals, it should work the same way over the periodics. So we should expect uh, its periodic version, periodic analog, uh, has, has similar property. Uh, how do I, I mean, like this is a little bit annoying. So for, for this, to, to avoid this sort of the pole here, Pole is usually something a little annoying. So what we'll do is I will fix an A in Z and not divisible. In fact, what I want to do is I want to fix A in Z and P does not divide A. And, uh, and also if you do A mod P, this is a generator of Z mod P Z cross. I want to fix a sort of, sort of primitive, uh, what's it called, primitive root, like, I want, I want to fix, I guess, a gener, ah, I want to fix a generator of this multiplicative group, Z mod PZ cross. This is just sort of, sort of some technical issues. And instead of interpolating, uh, interpolating uh, zeta value, I interpolate this number instead. This is a completely purely technical issues. And you see that, you know, this number is, uh, well, I mean, it's zero if n is negative one, of course, if, you know, if, I mean, it's zero if n is negative one and is divisible by p if, I guess, uh, if n is congruent to negative one uh, modulo p minus one. So somehow this is why in the Kummer congruence, we have to avoid this. Needs to avoid this. So this is somehow where, why we need to do this. Okay. So now let's do the, let's, let's do the interpolation. I'm going to consider the, a measure as a, as I said in the previous lecture, it's kind of a summary of this. I want to consider a measure called the mu of A. I mean, because it would depend on what this A is, the choice of A, on ZP, such that the amis transform A mu A. I mean, the measure of A corresponds to a power series, right? So the corresponding power series written like this is equal to one over t minus a of one, my, one plus t to the a minus one. So basically you can kind of see that if you don't choose this a here, then you don't have this term here. Then somehow the piada function will be one over t. Uh, this doesn't quite uh, belong to what you want it to be a power series in t because you know t, one over t is it's not a power series in t. So you have to subtract the pole here. So you see that when you have this a here, it kind of automatically get rid of this pole one over t here. But let's do it, let's do it, let's do it more carefully. So what is this? Let's do this calculation a little bit more carefully, let's see. So what is the size? This is a, if you expand it out, this, oopsie. So this looks like a t plus a choose two t squared and so on and so forth, right? I mean, it should be one plus, and then the one plus got killed. And now this is what? This is one over t. I mean, you a kills with this a here. So this will become one over t times one plus, I guess, a over two, a over two over a with t, and then a over three, excuse me, a choose three 
over a t square and so on and so forth, right? And then you can do a kind of a Taylor expansion, right? This or or geometric series. So this is going to be uh, one minus this, this thing. And then plus the same thing squared and then go on, go on forever. Now what you notice is that this one over T here really exactly kills with this one over T here. And then you're left with some sort of power series. And you can really check because the T A is not divided by P. So this denominator A doesn't really matter. So all of these numbers are also integer coefficients. So therefore it belongs to the power series, right? The P double bracket T. It looks, of course, a lot neater if you know write it in terms of this. But really, what it is is what it really is is somehow this power series in, uh, in T. And of course, the kind of a pole is related to that you have a T here. Then integration of uh. Or maybe I shouldn't try d mu, just mu a x. So if I if I put this measure and you I integrate the function x to the n, I will get a to the one one plus n power minus one times zeta negative n. Okay. So this is for uh for, I guess for n odd. For n even, this should give you this should give you zero both sides, I think. So let's do proof. Uh, so let's see. So let's prove this. So, so you see that this is very interesting that you, the zeta value can be interpreted as some sort of a measure in the sense that if you put some sort of how x to the n, some sort of a power, you integrate that power will precisely give you this zeta value. So let's prove this. It's just a straightforward calculation. So let's see. So I integrate x to the n mu a x. What is this? I'm going to rewrite this x to the n as something different. Let's do, we can actually do it quite formally. So I want to write it as e to the t x, excuse me, mu a x. So I, I start with the function e to the t x. I take a derivative that with respect to t, which is another sort of formal variable, has nothing to do with x, right? It's, it's t is some sort of completely formal variable. So I take derivative with respect to t, so exactly n times. That's gonna give me, uh, I mean, because you see, that, uh, let me just write it over here. So you see that d dt of e to the tx is precisely x to the nth e to the tx. Now after that, you evaluate t equals zero. So now this goes away, so you get, you're left with x to the nth. So these are the same. But I wanna write it in, sort of in a completely fancy way. Now this is equal to d dt and t equals zero of integration of one plus e to the t x. Oh, I want to think of it as sort of e to t and then e to t to the x. So I have e to t two plus one x mu a x. Now recall that the Amis transform, let me write it on the upper left corner here. For a, uh, for a measure mu, the corresponding power series attached to that is integration of the p of one plus t to the x d mu or mu excuse me uh, I didn't even have mu it's just mu of x. Okay, so now this looks very much like that. Oopsie, this looks very much like that. Except I'm going to take this to be my t, and that's exactly what you see here. So now <coughs> it's the same as d dt of n t equals zero of a mu <coughs> of e to the t minus one, right? By Amis transform, somehow this is equal my t and this whole expression now equals to the Amis transform of that. 
But now we know that my, I choose, chose my A mute T to be like this expression. So now I can really plug in. So what I, what it is is somehow, uh, uh, so I can plug in, uh, really, uh, let me, maybe, maybe, uh, okay, fine. So this is what, this is one over T minus one. So this one over T is the term here, minus A of one plus T. So that's E to the T to the eighth power minus one, okay. So I'm going to call this one f a of t. And what I'm doing is I'm, we know this is equal to that. And I take an nth derivative at, at t equals 0. So, so I, get, I can continue this. This is equal to f a nth derivative at 0. For, for f a t equals that. So now, what is, what, now we have to compute this f a and derivative a, uh, zero. So what this is, is uh, let's continue maybe. This is one over, you have two terms. This is one over t e to the t minus one, taking nth derivative at t equals zero, minus a of e to the a t minus one, taking nth derivative, evaluated at t equals zero, okay? So the first term, Recall that my uh, earlier theorem here, right? My, my zeta minus n, negative n, is minus one to the nth power times this nth derivative of this, this function here. And that's precisely what we're doing here. So the first term is so minus one to the nth power zeta minus n, but n is all, so. So you just get that. And second term is almost the same as the first term, except that we have a, on the t, I have some extra factor a here. And if you do a little bit of calculation, this is actually, you can see that this is just my, negative of a to the n minus one power of zeta. This is some sort of change of variable with the previous term. Uh, ah, and this is a negative term here, so therefore, all together, excuse me, that's equal to a to the n minus plus one minus one times theta minus one. So that's, that's our theorem. So that's our theorem. That if I integrate, integrate x to the n under this measure, I really get the zeta value. Okay, now I wanna explain how to prove Kummer's congruence. So proof of Kummer's congruence. Using this. So let's go maybe go back and then copy and paste the Kummer congruence to here. Uh, let's see. So let's do this. So how do I do Kummer's congruence? Well, by theorem, we know that what is, uh, but by theorem, we know that somehow if I integrate, it's the same measure. I want to choose A as before. If I integrate X to the N1, N1 mu A, X, that's equal to A to the N1 plus one minus one, zeta one over N1. And if I do integrate x to the n2 mu a x, I get a to the n2 plus one minus one, zeta minus n2. Okay, so now I look at the left hand side. We note that x to the n1 is always coming to x to the n2. Uh, well, because I guess because my n1 and n2 are, co ah. Because n or n2 are congruent modulo p minus one to the p to the k minus one, then, then these two will automatically congruent modulo p to the k. 
and therefore, and therefore, because mu n it belongs to ZPT with integral coefficient, this would automatically imply that, or maybe uh, sort the PI evaluation of ZP of x to the m1 minus x n2 will pair that with mu a will be at least sort or at least somehow this thing will be divisible by p to the k. So therefore the, the the thing on the left is congruent mod p to the k. On the other hand of course on the other hand you of course you can you can show that it's not that difficult to show that this uh the ratio of these two is also congruent to one mod p to the k. So therefore basically introducing this A doesn't really interfere with the congruence you want to prove. So now having these two all together, you deduce that zeta my negative n1 is congruent to zeta negative n2 uh, mod p to the k. And also I should say this is not, uh, this is not divisible by p. It's also used here. So good. So so somehow this gives a, a interesting way to prove Kummer's congruent. I think original Kummer's proof was to play with the, uh, uh, I guess Bernoulli numbers, but now uh, we interpret everything in terms of PID integrations. And what's I guess better is that somehow I have this in interesting measure that really explains all these special values of zeta function. In fact, to get the so-called PID function, there's a third step, which is um, well, not quite, uh, uh, it's not that easy. It's not very obvious why we wanna do that. But let me try to explain why we wanna do that. So it's called restriction to ZP cross. So I have my mu, let me, let, I have my mu A, the measure here, which is uh, a measure on ZP. The correct PIL function is actually, or PIL zeta function is, restriction of this PID measure to ZP cross. So let me give a definition first and I'll explain, or I give some sort of reason why we wanna do this. So the uh, PID zeta function. This is Kubata Leopold. L function is the measure mu a restricted to zp cross, or rather somehow maybe a, a continuous function on zp cross with values in cp, G, qp. I want to denote this by mu kubata leopold comma a, depending on the a, but then if you want to measure, I mean, you, you want, if you want something without a pole, I guess you have to do this. So let me explain why restriction to ZP cross. So maybe we already kind of see a little bit over here. Over here, I, I need some sort of congruence like this. There's one reason. I mean, you, you see, I need some congruence here. So over ZP cross, this is okay. But then if P divide X, I really need, this is where I really need N1, N2 to be both greater than equal to K. But if you think about it, this is a little bit strange. I mean, right? I mean, if P does not divide X, what I need, what I what I'm using is that some sort of uh, sort of uh, sort of comp, uh, sort of multiplicative uh, sort of order of this mod P to the K. But when P divide K, I'm I'm really using sort of Archimedean norms of uh, sort of actually Archimedean absolute value of n one and n two, the actual usual absolute value, and so you just want them to be larger now so that these are just both zero. The, the two proofs are of very different nature. Uh, so I guess somehow it makes more sense to say maybe this is not the correct thing to talk about at all. Let's just maybe ignore them. That's one way to see it from the proof, I guess. Here's a more philosophical reason. It's because as in explains in Keith's class, if I take the Galois group of QP and take a sort of maximum abelian extension, or maybe I should say pro P 
a billion extension of this. I know maybe I wanted to the ramify part. I ramify part is not very important, uh, not interesting, I guess, for some reasons. Oh, excuse me, Q, my bad. Uh, sorry. If you take the probe here, a billion part of the Galois group of Q, this is the same as Galois group of Q adjoining all P power roots of unity. And Keith explained this is ZP cross. So this ZP cross is precisely the ZP cross I wanted to talk about. So this is a PRDL function. It's canonically a measure on this. As opposed to sort of abstract ZP cross. I guess one should sort of conceptually understand that PRDL function is a measure on this Galois group as a sort of canonical object. And also, this is also illustrated by, you know, we, when we say integrate, when we, earlier on we write, okay, integrate of this thing, of mu of something, right? Let me just write quad uh, There's a question of why x to the n, right? I mean, what's different, well, like why is somehow, okay, okay, it's a monomial, but why is monomial so special from other things? But if I change this to zp cross, this monomial is a character. The correct way to think of a monomial is a character of ZP cross with values in say QP cross and goes X to, this is, this is really a character. But that's the correct way to think of this. Somehow you think of it that way, you, you should think of it as somehow when you do this integration like this, you're taking a character of the cyclotomic, the Galois group of cyclotomic extension. So this is called a power of a cyclotomic character, I guess. And then evaluating that at that character should give you L value. So I guess as data value. So that's somehow sort of the idea. So let me sort of state this actual theorem without the proof. It would take a little bit of time to prove this. So I would probably just sort of skip this. For every n greater than equal to two, if I integrate x to the n of mu Kubata Leopold of A, but on ZP, ZP cross now, this is equal to minus n and one minus the usual two factors had before, and now I have one minus p to the n uh, of zeta minus n here. So, so I have some extra factor here. Another way to think of this, where this extra factor comes from, is that I can sort of combine this together, and I think of this as analytic continuation of zeta function, but I want to remove the factor at p. Remember the zeta function has a Euler product structure, one thing product of one over L to the negative S, right? But if you think about this, so if you really take L equals to p, what you have here is one minus p to the negative S. But one, but when, but, but when you evaluate, at s equals to negative n, this term, if l equals p and s equals to negative n, this is precisely one over p to the n, right? Once you multiply that with one over p to the n here, that has the effect of removing the corresponding factor. So multiplying by this means that you remove the corresponding factor at p. So a factor at p. Removed. This is sort of the general philosophy going on. So here's a here's a general general philosophy. So suppose there's some so-called L function. For example, Riemann data function or Dirichlet alpha function, dedicated data, uh, dedicated data function, or more general alpha function attached to module form or automotive forms, even more general. Suppose there's some alpha function, Ls, L something S. There should be a, maybe not quite A, or maybe some, or A or some. This is more technical later on. This is, uh, let's just sort of, it's good enough to sort of think about this as A P alpha function as a, usually a measure on ZP cross. 
So maybe call it meal of L. It, it will satisfy some properties like the following. So if you integrate uh, on ZP cross of some sort of characters x to the n, mu L, this will be equal to some simple factors here times your L function, but not quite the L function. You have to do some modification of the factor at P. And also the value here, N, corresponds to the exponent N here. So this is sort of the, the general philo uh, philosophy. And even better, you can also insert here something called a character of z mod p to the nz cross with values say, say in qp uh, p, uh, say, say in okay say in qp bar algebra culture of qp okay you can insert something in here and that would have the effect of just one sec let me change it to a different color so that would have the effect of over here you kind of a twist by some sort of facade. This should also be kind of equal. So that's sort of the general philosophy that whenever you have some sort of reasonable L function, there should be a associated PL function satisfying these type of properties, satisfying these types sort of type of properties. And you know, uh, of course, the question of whether you can construct that sort of PL function that's kind of a uh, that's kind of a, actually a large industry that people are working on this, of trying to construct various PIDL functions in the various situations. Uh, and this is, uh, and this, this general uh, sort of theory is uh, it's in the framework of the theory, people, a lot of people working on this. I'll end all my talks here, and I hope that somehow discussing sort of functions on ZP and talk about these measures, uh, sort of fun uh, I'll talk about model expansion and these measures and relating to it, them to uh, uh, zeta values, I hope to, you know, interest you to study sort of PID aspect of sort of number theoretical objects, in particular these PIDL functions or PIDL theory of the sort of, uh, you know, characters or, or modular forms and so on and so forth. Okay, thank you very much for your time to listen to me. I'll stop here then. Uh,